I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. If you love listening to this show as much as I love hosting it, I think you'll really like the Medal of Honor podcast, produced in partnership with the Medal of Honor Museum. Each episode talks about a genuine American hero and the actions that led to their receiving our nation's highest award for valor. They're just a few minutes each, so if you're looking for a show to fill time between these Warriors episodes, I think you'll love the Medal of Honor podcast. Search for the Medal of Honor podcast wherever you get your shows. Thanks. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Today, we'll hear from machinist mate third class Norman Jensen. Jensen served on submarines during World War II, and his unofficial job was that of a combat cameraman. In this first part of his interview, Jensen explains how he became a combat cameraman and recounts the famous O-19 rescue. I went through boot camp. I was the number two man with a crow on my shoulder there in uh, boot camp. I had 125 guys under my belt for a while there. And they call him, I don't even remember what they call him, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, when I got all through, I'd put down where I wanted to go was to diesel training. About that time, just before the boot camp was over with, my brother came. He was in the Marine Corps. Big old master sergeant. I mean, he was 225 pounds, all man. <laughs> and the chief petty officer who was in charge of our company, 417, and my brother had been shipmates together on the Richardson, the General Richardson, the overseas in peacetime. And my brother asked me, he says, Norm, he says, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to diesel school. Obviously, he must have told the chief there that what I wanted to go, because when I went from out of boot camp into OGU, which is called outgoing unit, son of a gun, I stayed from October, clean through till the 20th of December there. What's going on? Did they forget me? Whatever, what's going on? Next thing I knew about the 21st of December of 43, I was on my way to Navy Pier in Chicago, diesel school. 410 guys in, uh, in each one of those places. I went through, went to, I had otitis media where I, I had my ear punctured. It healed. and Otherwise, I wouldn't be in SEAL, as a submarine service. But I went into uh, the, that diesel school. I came out number 10, third class petty officer. I felt pretty good about that. In fact, actually, one of the chiefs there, it was interesting to note that one of the chiefs there at that particular time, they had not a uh, knot tying school, you know, ropes and tying knots and so forth like that. I taught him four or five things like uh, from fishermen's knots and so forth like that. And he was tickled pink, but it was interesting. So uh, that's just an aside. <laughs> I learned from there, the diesel school. Then when I went to submarine school, went through all the preliminaries, got through sub school itself. I went to advanced diesel school in submarines on the diesels themselves from the, uh, the schools running the actual diesels aboard submarines. In the Navy, there's an all kinds of things. There, there are different types of things with reference to glamour. Uh, there's different types of work to do. There's different actions and different activities going on at all times. One of the best places for diesel engineering is in submarines. I had been with my uncle and my own on his fishing boat, the Cuddy Sark, and he had an old time diesel engine there. And as a kid at five and six years old, I had the opportunity of working with him getting in his way most of the time. And as a result of it, I became interested in diesels. You don't find diesels on destroyers. You don't find them on anything else, but basically submarines or the captain's gig or something like that on other surface vessels. I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to become an engineer, and as a result of it, and also the fact that an ind individual can get 20% sea pay on top of everything, correction, 50% sea pay on top of everything, so I volunteered. And I volunteered basically when I was at diesel school in, New, in uh, Navy Pier in Chicago. Fortunately, 
I came out number 10 in a class of 410, and that didn't hurt. I came out as a third-class motor machinist mate, and then I volunteered, and it was interesting. I knew that these uh, submarines were basically and fundamentally diesel-electric. I didn't know too much about electricity. I do now a great deal about it because I was studying not only submarines, but subsequently in my own business. But uh, they're the only place that I know where you could get experience from A to Z with reference to working on diesels. And it's also a, a rather unique service that submarine service is. Basically and fundamentally, the romance with reference to submarines was downplayed, surprisingly enough. And you were looked at askance in a way, well, what do you want to go into those things for? You're going to get killed. I looked at it from the standpoint of, hey, they got the best machines, they got the best of everything, I want the best. And in order to get the best, you had to be the best. So it worked out quite well. The submarine school in New London, Connecticut, also there was one in Pearl Harbor. I don't know if that got bombed or not, but whatever it was, there's one Pearl and also in uh, New London. I went to New London. Uh, when you first got there, you were shoved in with about 500 guys where 200 should be. And it was elimination rapidly, whether you could get along or not. And they had people in there who were spotters, in essence, who could see whether you could or couldn't get along. They watched your interaction with other individuals. If you rubbed elbows with someone, did you have a burr on your shoulder or a, uh, whatever you wanted to call it? Or did you get angry or something? And I know doggone well that they had people in there who went out of their way to do just exactly that to see how well you could take it. And let me tell you, when you get about 500 guys where 200 go, you can get pretty sore in a hurry if you're not careful, especially if someone's trying to provoke you. And there are ways of getting away from provoking. We did not understand what was going on, mind you, until after you got all the way through the sub-school. Then you began to look back with and say, wow, I lucked out. At least I could hold my temper to a, to a certain degree. And from there on out, the next thing you went through would be a pressure chamber to see if you could stand the pressure to learn how to get your ears to clear them. And then they would take you to the diving chamber. In the tank, you have a line that goes up from the bottom to the top of 100 feet, about 110 feet, actually. Every so often, there's a knot. You put a monsman long on, and then you turn right around, you go up to that spot, you take a couple of breaths, predetermined. You go to the next one, the next one, the next one. Uh, you're going to have to hold yourself from going up fast with that lung on you. It's a big old blue in the thing out here, you know. And as a result of it, you have to control yourself. Well, that helps equalize the pressure as you go up. Otherwise, wow, you're going to have the bends in a hurry. At the time I went through, they were requiring you to go at 50 feet, but I volunteered at 100. I went down to 100, and the first two notches, I went up too fast, and the this is what surprised me. A guy came out from the side, no lung on, nothing around him at all, went over there, grabbed hold of me and says, three times, slow down, bud. We learned that. And I did. No trouble after that. That could have eliminated me if I went ahead and did it the second time. You know what I mean, going up. Because they were looking for things to eliminate. They didn't care whether you made it or not because they knew once you got through all these other preliminary things of elimination, and you made that, you were smart enough or you wouldn't have got in there in the first place and selected in the first place to be able to continue on. So, <laughs> and then you get in that pressure chamber. It was interesting. They'll have someone in there start screaming and yelling and squawking and you want to see how well you take it under pressure. I mean, compressed pressure. It's a different world. So <laughs> there's no question about that. Well, to be quite frank and honest about it, if you didn't know how to swim, you'd have never got to that point anyway. If you were going up into the tank, yeah, you'd have to learn how to swim. It isn't a question that they're going to teach you how to swim, because if you don't know it by then, you're never going to get even selected in the first place. I don't recall if I ever checked off something, if I could swim or something like that. No, I didn't do that. But I do know that I can swim. I still like to swim in my backstroke, that's all. In the situation in, in boot camp, you usually used your hands in such a manner that you'd hold on to the life vest to keep it from bust in your neck and jump off a oh, 20, 30 foot, you know, like you're going overboard. But in the submarine, you don't have much use for those things. I think they've got a few of them, but I haven't, I don't believe I've ever seen a life vest on a submarine. You want truth about it. You're either going to go or you're not going to go. Charlie Spritz, chief torpedo man. 
I guess, as I understand it, he was a single guy, and he devoted himself strictly to New London, Connecticut's submarine service. Probably was the most toughest human being I've ever met. And I didn't get to know him too well. I didn't want to know him too well in the first place, because then that probably would have been eliminated. But the fact remains that this man just pounded it into your head. Keep your keep quiet. Listen to what's going on. Learn. And let me tell you, if you didn't run between classes and if you weren't neat and clean all the time, because there's no room for, for dirt on a submarine, although it gets pretty messy sometimes, but you know how to clean it up. If, if you turn right around and, and if you don't do what you're supposed to do to keep yourself clean and neat, because a clean and a neat person also has a reasonable personality, you take care of yourself. And if he found anything like that, you didn't see that guy the next day. And as a result of it, he ran that thing for the enlisted men. There's no question about it. And I'll tell you one thing. He instilled within everybody's mind the fear of God with reference to him from the standpoint that, listen, Buster, your life and every other guy's life depends upon you. And we learned that. And when you got aboard the boats and you began to see what was going on, you knew darn well what you were doing was either the right thing or you found out in a hurry. There's no room for questions on a submarine when it's, the action comes in. You better know it. And if you don't know it, they'll train you afterwards. You just step aside, wait until you can perform. I believe that uh, Charles Spritz, the chief Spritz, was not only his nature to a certain extent, he was a human being, and he was really a nice guy. But by golly, he had a job to do, and he did it, and he did it with forbearance, and let me tell you something. You listened to him, and you did what he said. If not, out you go. He put the fear in you from the standpoint that we work together here. We're a team. And you're going to do it my way while you're here. Because when you go in a submarine, you're going to do it the way it's supposed to be done. And let me tell you, when you got into the classroom, anybody could be eliminated from that by ABCDs, you know, the grades. But when it came to working with people, he was the one that was instrumental in putting the fear. And even today, I think about him once in a while. I really do. Jensen, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> when I stick my mouth open sometimes when I shouldn't. And it really, seriously, uh, it wasn't a fear. I think if you want to call it something that's similar to Pavlov's theory of conditioning, he really conditioned us, and it didn't hurt one bit. It was actually a, a big help to us. My understanding, he was there throughout the whole war, and he retires. He was ready to be retired before the war start, or just before the war started, but he stayed the whole time, from what I understand. The officers at that school were smart enough to leave him alone because they knew some of those guys there were going through there, knew that they were going to have to serve under these boys here, 18, 19-year-old kids. Remarkable what they could do at that age. I had the opportunity of going to uh, Submarine Division 201 on board the Proteus. We left Pearl Harbor. We went out to Guam. We were situated in Guam, Apra Harbor, in fact. In fact, they were still shooting on the base, I mean, on the beach in there and trying to mop up what was going on in, uh, at uh, Guam. It was still invaded. We were invading it as such, you might say. And in the process of, of doing that, why I turned right around and wound up getting the opportunity of working on the vessel. Now, one has to understand that when a submarine comes along side the tender, they're going to be there for 14 days. That boat is going to be there. It's called the, yeah, it's called the refit. Uh, and I was part of what they call the refit crew. I was assigned to, say, the queenfish in the first place. That's the first one I was assigned to. Okay, I stayed on that vessel for 14 solid days, working 8, 10, 12 hours. There's no limit on it. When I got tired, I had a regular watch quarter and station period, but we usually went over because we wanted to pride in performance, you might say. The end result was is that if anyone was going to be replaced, if there's a motor Mac aboard the Queenfish that was being transferred, maybe there are 10 guys in the refit gang, one of those 10 from that group was going to be placed on it. In other words, you were going to be replaced on that vessel and you did your darndest work because you didn't know what was going to happen. And it's, it's just pride and performance. So basically and fundamentally, that's basically where you got your opportunity to go. Now, in regards to learning how to uh, 
the other parts of the vessel. When you got aboard the submarine, then you began to learn how to run the torpedoes, I mean, how to load torpedoes. That was mostly done in the, in, on the beach, in essence, before you were left out for war patrol. But how to load the torpedoes in the tubes, how to fire the torpedoes, how to work the forward and after uh, bow planes, the helm, and everything else. And they're a little different than most vessels. <laughs> There's no question about it. But that's where you, you learn the vessel. And let me tell you, every minute that you have any time off, you're studying. In order to qualify... Not only did you have to show what you were doing, I was taken into a room. What are, the, what are the compartments, you might say? Lights were out. All right, Jensen, where are you? They spun you around. They get you screwed up. They put you in there. You find out where you are in a hurry. Now, find this valve. You had to know it that well. And let me tell you, it might be in the maneuvering room, might be in the uh, forward engine room. And boy, I had to know everything about the forward and after engine room, everything. And then as a result of it, you really became quite well trained in it. The beauty of it is, every guy on there wants you to know their job. The reason for that is, anything happens to him, you can take his place. That, that's the reason for it. And it's, there's no question about it from the standpoint of being able to learn. You have to be able to, almost like a photographic memory. It's, it's that way. And you've got a copy of, your, of the, the, the vessel you got a big, long blueprint of that vessel and everything in it. Not just everything in it, but enough of it that'll give you the idea of the systems and so forth. And you have to know how to, what a negative tank and blow it and so forth. And I was lucky. I was assigned to what they call the auxiliary gang. I went all over. I lucked out. Besides doing up uh, in the shears with reference to lookout and so forth. In working up in the uh, conning tower and so forth like that, that basically and fundamentally was officer's work. We knew what it could do, just a general knowledge of it. And as far as working the periscope, I was one of the few enlisted men who ever, everybody got a chance to see through it. But I was one of the few enlisted men because of working in photography and combat status as a, although as a motor machinist mate, but working in, a, in ex excess of complement as a combat photographer, I designed and developed one of those little pieces of uh, metal that was put on the periscope so I can just slap the camera on it and take pictures through it. And if the periscope came down, it would automatically flip the camera off so it wouldn't get caught in the, in the well itself, the periscope well. Uh, as a result of it, I was pretty lucky, one of the few who ever got a chance to take pictures through a periscope and the actual motion pictures of it. And no, most of that TDC, the torpedo data computer and stuff like that, that was very highly technical. We knew what it could do, that was sufficing. We were looking at systems, how to handle that vessel, how to sink her down, how to get her up and everything else like that, how to make sure that the auxiliary, everything was working properly. You probably have heard most submarines say, keep a zero bubble. That means keep everything level, Buster. Make it straight, make it firm, make it functional, make it work. By keeping a zero bubble, that meant when we fire a torpedo, we knew it was going to go where it was supposed to go. If you had an upward gradient on the, the bow planes, it was going to go climbing until it eventually got. That could lead it to a point where it leveled off in a spot where it might be five feet higher than it should be. And wouldn't get, it might get only the upper part of the vessel instead of the bottom part of the vessel. It could be that critical. Once they get on level, that's it. There's zero bubble. Uh, being on submarine service, there's a thing called pride and performance. There's also certain cockiness that goes with that. And some of our submariners got a little bit too cocky. And they got into trouble with some of the bubbleheads. No, they never got any trouble with another bubblehead, but they did with the squids and all the other guys who were surface guys. And we got kind of a wrong name, perhaps rightly so. But I'll tell you one thing. If one bubblehead got in trouble, there were 50 of them that were right with him. The same way with the surface guys. But they soon learned to realize that there was something more to it than just what met the eye. Uh, there's cockiness that comes with pride and performance. There's cockiness that knows that, that comes with a, an individual knowing doggone well that he's damn good in, in, in what he's doing, or he wouldn't be there in the first place. But there also comes a little bit of a humbleness that comes in it when you begin to take a look at the long range aspect of it. And... I'll tell you, you make some lifelong friends. Some of the things which, which is 
is good is that uh, those friends are there forever. But the, uh, the surface fleet looked upon us as God's gift to mankind. And in a way, we were. <laughs> Excuse me for being blunt, but it was the case. You have to recognize when Pearl Harbor hit, there wasn't one surface vessel that could go out without an escort, and there were no escorts. The only thing that they had was about maybe eight or nine submarines that was our defense and our attack aspect until the, the Gato class and others that were before that came into existence. Then we went into full mode, you might say. So the only thing that was between us and the Japanese end of empire were about maybe five or six submarines, or at the very most, ten. And surprisingly enough, a lot of them were sunk down deliberately at Pearl Harbor to keep from being hit at the dock. Some of those guys were smart enough to close the hatches and open a negative and drop right down 10 feet or whatever was necessary to keep them underwater. Not one submarine was hit that I know of, but they're all old ones anyway, so probably wouldn't have hurt too much to have them gone, although that was the only line of defense we had. That's that pearl. And let me tell you, it's only been just very recently that anything about World War II submarines is being known about. Actually, if it wasn't for the fact that we had those submarines there, I don't know what kept the Japanese from not invading Pearl Harbor. That was the biggest mistake they ever made, and I'm glad they made it. Because <laughs> they came to our shore, you know, and, and, and bombed or shot up uh, Oregon to a certain extent. And as a result of it, what else could have happened? We weren't prepared for it. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready-to-eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Looking for calorie-conscious options? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. Hi, I'm Sean McCabe. And I'm Carrie McCabe. We are, well, married, obviously, <laughs> but we're also obsessed with the darker side of things. True crime stories, alien abductions, poltergeists. If it leaves you scratching your head and keeping those lights on at night, we want to hear about it. That's why we host the podcast Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Every week, we bring our listeners a true story guaranteed to send chills down your spine, from history's most brutal serial killers to the mystery of spontaneous human combustion. Yep, lots of these stories leave unanswered questions behind, and you'll get to poke through the rubble of the evidence with a hardened skeptic and... Someone whose mind is more open to fun. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> You can find Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie wherever you get your podcasts, and on social media at Ain't It Scary. Come play with us. I was introduced to what was known as Project 5. I knew it as 5. I was at muster one morning getting ready, and we always had muster to let us know what we we're supposed to be doing that day, where to go, or if they needed you in another place which was nothing unusual because you shifted around in the refit crew too, although I spent most of my time in diesel work. When a gentleman's officer stepped up and says, are there any of you young men here have ever had any photographic experience? 
Well, my mind went kind of worrying, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. But I said, yes, sir, I've had some. Have you ever had any motion picture experience? I said, yes, sir, I have had it. He says, where have you had it? I said, at Brigham Young University when I was going to college there. I had about, oh, I guess it was about six, eight months of college there before I went into the Navy. I was in the Navy, but I was waiting for going into a, a training school at New, in the University of New Mexico. Anyway, the end result was, he says, well, come with me, young, uh, Jensen. He knew who I was. I went up there, and the first thing I was known as grilled quite a bit, given a camera, taking some pictures, and go out and shoot it, and bingo, bongo, whatever you want to call it. I did, turned it in. Next thing I knew, I was aboard the Queenfish, in excess of compliment. Being in excess of compliment was a very simple thing. You have your regular crew. They put one more on it, or maybe two on it. Now, I'm coming in as a motor machinist mate third class at that time, and as a result of it, I'm carrying a camera, a 16-millimeter camera with a magazine load job. There's 50 feet in each one of those magazines, and as a result of it, I had around, I think, around 35 or 40 magazines. I went aboard the Queenfish. We went down to the island of Truck, which was at that time sort of bypassed. It was interesting, very interesting. I took a few pictures, not too many, because there wasn't much action. Truck, had uh, the Queenfish had just come back from an Awa Maru incident, but, and as a result of it, they sent the crew to another spot for a little bit of easy, easy run for lifeguard duty when the airplanes were coming over and bombing it. They bypassed truck, by the way, which was a marvelous situation. And they kept them isolated, and they practically starved them to death in there. So when I came back, the next thing I knew is I was back in Camp Dealey. The purpose of the photography aspect of it, and particularly motion pictures, was that all of a sudden, Admiral Lockwood and others found out that they hadn't had any type of motion pictures or any... Uh, combat photography, uh, uh, photographic pictures whatsoever of any actions on from submarines. Nothing. And it's unique in that sense of the word because you go on the beach, there's combat, regular for combat photographers all over the place. Nothing like that. You're too doggone much business. You're down there to get ships, not take pictures of it, not to glorify yourself. The silent service is exactly that. They're not out of their way to glorify themselves. I said, like right now, I'm not exactly in love with glorifying myself, but I'm helping you out in that sense of the word. But the fact remains that nothing was taken. So they sent out a few photographers, guys like myself, who had little training, if anything at all. And by luck and by golly, it turned out pretty good. When I came back from the, on the Queenfish from the War Patrol off truck, I immediately gave the film that I had to one of the officers there and wrote out a the information that they requested of me. And I went to Camp Dealey, which is for rest and recuperation. Uh, under normal conditions, why, that's what happens. You get two weeks off. Well, I was there, oh, for about uh, two days, and all of a sudden I got request from an officer came out there and says, Jensen, uh, Admiral Lockwood, or Captain Lockwood, whatever he was at the time, would like to speak to you. What the heck have I done? I don't know. Well, he says, but he'd like to speak to you. Get your gear and bring it with you. Something wrong. This time was in Apra Harbor in Guam, where the uh, queenfish was located. So I came back from there to the aboard the Proteus, where he was located. He had his office in that place. He said, Jensen, he says, your film is pretty good. And what we've seen, what you've taken, uh, the cod is leaving in the morning. We would like you to go out on that. Do you have any objection to it? I said, no, sir, I don't. But I have one request from it from you. He says, what is that? I said, I don't want just 10 canisters or what you call magazines. I'd like about 50 of them. He said, how many have you got now? Well, I kind of fudged and told him I had 10, but I had 15. So he says, well, if I give you 25 more, will you be happy? I said, I'd like 30, sir. And he gave them to me. And as it turned out, it uh, worked out pretty good for me. But there's one thing I might mention here with reference to regarding the uh, spritz in his Navy. He instilled within us to keep our mouth shut wherever you went. Keep quiet. You don't say anything what you're doing. You don't tell anything about what you're doing or who to, uh, to any of them. When you write home, you don't tell them you're on a submarine and all that. In fact, the folks that I lived with before I left uh, for the military service didn't even know I was anywhere near submarines, nor had they any idea where I was for almost 30-some-odd months. 
I wrote to him, and that was it. I'm doing fine. Everything's okay. We might be a two or three month lapse between letters or something of that nature, but uh, we never told him. And when I got back from submarine service, even up until just recently, I've never said a thing about what has happened. It's been only about the last two years since the COD has been involved uh, with uh, in Cleveland that we began to sort of getting other people the idea, mainly because there's not too many old 77-year-old birds like me left that were in submarine service, and maybe they ought to know what happened, especially when you, you know, recognize that there were very few, very few submarines even at the beginning of Pearl Harbor. And <laughs> there's one incident I think should be known. About 1944, summers long in that time, a congressman let, I don't know who it was, but it could be easily enough traced, let everybody in the world know that our submarines, ha, 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 were not being depth charged by the Japanese because they can go down to 300 feet and they have their sub, their depth charges higher than uh, 300 feet. Then we began to lose vessels. So you can be, see the, the, the seriousness of that situation. The basic fundamental instructions I was receiving was to work closely with the captain. And he says, all captains, particularly the one that on the COD, and I'll take, for example, on that one, all captains have been instructed to work with you or you work with them. And it's not that hard to work with those skippers. They're pretty doggone good. But you've got to watch it because you're an extra man on deck. And they're used to only so many in the shears and so many elsewhere. And they know exactly where everyone is. And I had to do one thing. Wherever I went, that skipper knew exactly where I was all the time. He says, okay. I says, I'm up in the bow, Captain. Yes, sir. That's all right, Fine, son. That's good. Something to that nature. I let him know where I was all the time. And we get to an incident, what could happen to, I'm glad he knew where I was too, because we got strafed and a few things like that at, at a later time. But basically, use your own judgment as, as such. And particularly, I was very fortunate when I went on the cod with reference to the uh, rescue of the Dutch submarine 019. After Admiral Lockwood made the request for me to go aboard the COD, and I got my film, by the way, which was making me happy, I was now again in excess of compliment, meaning that I was an extra hand. Well, the first thing that happened, of course, was that we're traveling from Apra Harbor in Guam to uh, Subic Bay in the Philippines. We got to the Philippines, and as far as that goes, why, the first thing we did was take on fuel again. We make our own water as far as it goes, take on food. We didn't fire any torpedoes, but we did fire some 5-inch 25 practice, and we did fire 45, uh, I mean, uh, 50 caliber and uh, 40 millimeter. So we replenished all ammunition and all fuel. Then got our marching orders to go up to, I think it was something like the Gulf of Siam up in there. You have to recognize now, we're now in 45. We're probably in June of 45, early, early June, late June, early July of 45. And right then and there, the bombing by our aircraft, thank the good Lord for that, was going from, believe it or not, from the field there in APRA and the Philippines, and also where the island hopped elsewhere, and really leveling Japan a great deal. A lot of our submarines were now on lifeguard duty around Japan, but there still was a lot of mopping up to do elsewhere, because we had knocked off about probably 45% of the uh, Japanese shipping, and the surface fleet took the rest of it in, in, in the overall picture. So now we're going after those other aspects of the uh, getting the munition or whatever you want to call it, or foodstuffs or, or uh, oh, iron or whatever it is, or rubber to Japan so they could be manufactured. We're now using sampans and spit kits and so forth, 125, 135-foot vessels sailing. That's about all that was left, and we started knocking them off. Well, we were on station for about maybe 10 days, and one of our men got sick, sicker than the Dickens. And I mean really sick. And at that time, penicillin was beginning to be in part of the antidote, if you want to call it, or something of that nature. And this fellow was real sick. We got an ultra allowing us to come back to Subic Bay, bringing him with us. The next thing we knew, a day later, this ultra is a, a special means of communication. I won't even mention what it is. But the fact remains that um, it's part of that silent thing. I don't know if I'm allowed to or not, so I won't. But anyway, the end result is, is that about one day after we got the altar to bring him in, we got another one. 
the old Dutch submarine, the O-19, which had been up in the uh, Indian Ocean, up around Bombay in that area, along with several other Dutch submarines, had holed up a pocket German pocket battleship and its other group of support vessels. And they were ringing it in so that they couldn't get out. If they did, they'd have torpedoed it and it wouldn't have gone very far. And yet, surprisingly enough, with this young fellow that was the Dutchman that I got to talk to about it, he said it was interesting. He said, we'd go in on shore and we'd be shooting the breeze with the Germans and talking to them and everything else and saying, hey, we're going to get you yet. We're going to get you yet. Well, they never got him because the war ended by then. But the O-19 was sent, it was a mine layer, it was sent to come out and go around and back up into Subic Bay and to turn right around and get mines there and go on up into the Japanese uh, and mine their Sea of Japan and places like that. We would know where they were, and we would know where theirs were, the Japanese mines were, which was helpful. But instead, they'd gone five days without a fix. Now, the fix I'm talking about is a sighting, knowing exactly where they were, either noon or night or, or star or anything else, whatever it is, they didn't know where they were. We're getting into the, the, uh, the uh, hurricane period of time and nasty weather. Believe it or not, they hit the end of Lad Reef, L-A-D-D, Lad Reef, less than 500 feet from the end of it. Remarkable navigation even at that. And they went right up aground, I mean high and dry. And we were given an ultra. This guy, 58 guys are more important than one. You know what they did? They shoved 100,000 units of penicillin over the next four or five days. I think it was in his blood. Whatever it was, it was either white, purple, or green, but whatever it was, it cured him. <laughs> it was remarkable. When we first sighted the, the uh, O-19 on Lad Reef, and I heard the sighting, I went to the captain and says, Captain, what's he doing? Is he making any signal signs? He says, yes, he is. I said, I'd like to get some shots of it. He says, get your hindquarters up above there and do it. I had the utmost cooperation from Captain Westbrook that you could ever ask for. I only had one instruction. You let me know where you are at all times. You're in excess on deck. And I'm going to have to be reminded that you're on deck because it takes only so many seconds to get down with so many people and it takes longer with the extra person there. And I can leave you on deck. And he said, do you want that to happen? No, sir. I don't like my feet wet under these conditions. So I turned right around and got up there and I was able to take the signal blinking and so forth. And when we were starting to work with them on all of it, I said, sir, when you've got other men on deck, may I roam? He says, you go where you want to. I don't need to worry about you now. When we first approached it, all we saw was a blinking light. I can't read that stuff. I can get a dit, 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 and a dot, 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 and you know what I mean, SOS, but I wouldn't even know that if I recognize it now as far as that goes. But we came up to it, and here was this vessel. We approached it from the stern, and I got all pictures of, of it, motion pictures. Now, mind you, I also had a four by five camera, black and white. Eventually, I threw it overboard, but that's another story. But at any rate, the end result was is that I was able to take the pictures of it, and all I could see was the stern of that thing at an angle, probably about a 35 degree angle. It had hit the reef and gone boom right up and then sunk down. It just, it, it tore the bottom out of it and it janged in, jabbed into the, the deal. And it hit it at low tide, surprisingly enough. And at high tide, it couldn't get off. It was interesting, very interesting. But the end result was the same. They're still up there high and dry. And they had the stern almost underwater, just the very section. Yeah, about, was, for all practical purposes, it was underwater. But let me indicate one thing. I've been in the commercial fishing business. I'm still in it. I'm a master of my own vessel and so forth. But the key thing here is, I never in my life have seen a 212-foot vessel with twin screws navigated as in such tricky water as at Lad Reef with Captain Westbrook at the helm. He didn't do it. I mean, he gave the instructions, of course. Never in my life. There was about a three-and-a-half to four-knot current at all times, one direction or the other. And that man was a master at it. He didn't let anyone else because he wanted to take the full, full uh, responsibility. But even then... We hit bottom. We were sunk down. We had decks almost awash. Hey, <laughs> you want to blow up to get out, you know what I mean, as far as that goes. But it was remarkable what he did. The first thing we did was we came in there in the afternoon. We assessed how the comfort of the crew was. If they needed food or whatever it was, no. The skipper from the 
Captain, I forget, Van Hoofen or something of that nature, came over to talk to the Captain Westbrook. I got pictures of all that stuff. I was fortunate to be able to do it as they were coming across and so forth. But it was, it was interesting. That's when the fun began, you might say, really, to be able to get that. And the sadness was when the crew came off later on when we, they had to evacuate. But um, they came aboard. They discussed what they could do. The next day, we took our anchor chain and tried to pull it off at the same time that they were firing their torpedoes, their three-inch gun, and everything else, and backing down heavily, whatever they could do. And we were trying to pull it off at the same time to give it a jerk. You need to recognize that while we're still in enemy waters with the O-19, we had air coverage that came from, I don't know where, but I think it was the Philippines, I'm not sure. But we had air coverage that was constantly over us, flying all the time. It was at so far a range that, believe it or not, those guys could stay only 10 minutes and had to go back. So there was a constant group of people coming along. And they now had these magnetometers, magnometers or some doggone thing, where they could detect if there were submarines under the water. Anomaly, yeah, a magnetic anomaly they had that so that they could detect to see if anything was coming after us. We were the only one floating, of course. But... Uh, they disarmed the, the torpedo head, so I presume. At least they could they disarm the whatever. But there was enough water for that thing to shoot off and go off somewhere. So we never saw it explode, of course. But, but they tried to get it all on a jolt what it could. The strange thing about it is, is we broke the cable a few times, and then we tried to use our anchor chain. And the worst part of it was is that when that anchor chain went down into the bottom, it got tangled up in the corral, a coral down there, and we couldn't do a thing about it. Couldn't even get it off. Couldn't even back off on it because it hooked up. The little pieces of coral stuck within the, the lakes and so forth. So finally, we had to give in, and then they started to demolish it internally, we got everybody off and so forth. That was the saddest thing you ever saw in your life with those guys coming aboard. They'd been aboard that thing for five years, hadn't even been home for over five years, and to see them go. Did you see that? Little, if you had an opportunity, one of the fellows had a little doll, kind of like a Kachina doll that they have in the Hopis. And in the, in the result is, is that that doll had been with him and had been their good luck one. Well, it wasn't the total good luck one at the last of it, but it was interesting. So, you know, if you know what I'm referring to. It, it was really sad to see what those guys went through with. And let me tell you something. When you have 68 guys and 58 guys on a submarine that's built for 65 or 66, arms, legs, and ankles are all over the place. The reference to the champagne glass with reference to the insignia that's on the side of the cod, when we came in, we couldn't fly a flag because we didn't shoot anybody down or we didn't sink a vessel or anything else. It was the Dutch crew of the O-19 gave the crew of the cod, what do you want to call it, a, a celebration or a party is what it is. And it was a champagne party. Unfortunately, I did not get to attend because... As soon as I got on board, the, uh, got off the cod, I went immediately, in excess of compliment, I went immediately on board the Clyde and went back to subdivision 202, or whatever it was. See, we got in on the, on the, on the uh, 14th of the August, and the very next day, the correction, the 13th of August of 45, and the very next day, the war was over. I had no objection because in excess of compliment, I wouldn't want to have to hot bunk with someone on their boat. So you went right back to wherever man on the, on the cod had their own bunk then. Before that, you have three guys sleeping in two bunks and rotating. It's not bad. You got your own bedding. We gave them our bunks. We sat sleeping up or sitting down or wherever we could. We made them as comfortable as we could. Hey, they'd lived under hell for about four or five days there, trying to get off that reef and everything else. You do that. Hey, they're fellow submariners. We went out of our way for them. do everything we could. They sure went out of their way with the guys when, when they hit in, uh, in uh, Perth, Australia. We went into Fremantle's where the dock, uh, docks are, but Perth is where they had the, the deal. I didn't get to deal, go to that, doggone it. I'd like to have gone to it. But part of life, the war was over. You stay where you are now. You're going home. Oh, we took the crew of the Dutch submarine O-19 back to Subic Bay. And the process of going there, it took us about three days to get there. We left them off there, we refueled, took on more ammunition, 
and all the other things that you could think of. And by the way, we expended a couple of torpedoes into the Dutch sub 019, along with five inch 25 and 40 millimeter shells to wreck it. Plus they had demolition charges inside her, which blew the heck out of her. But it's still there, even to this day, the Dutch, the 019 is still on Lad Reef. You can see it. You can fly over it, or around it, or even take a skiff if you want to be a long row, but you can still make it. That was machinist mate third class Norman Jensen. Next week on Warriors in Their Own Words, we'll hear how he narrowly escaped death from machine gun fire and about the unique camaraderie between submariners. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcast.com. We're always looking to improve the show. For updates and more, follow us on Twitter at team underscore Harbaugh. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rule Hoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words. Hi, I'm Sean McCabe. And I'm Carrie McCabe. We are, well, married, obviously, (laughs) but we're also obsessed with the darker side of things. True crime stories, alien abductions, poltergeists. If it leaves you scratching your head and keeping those lights on at night, we want to hear about it. That's why we host the podcast Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Every week, we bring our listeners a true story guaranteed to send chills down your spine, from history's most brutal serial killers to the mystery of spontaneous human combustion. Yep, lots of these stories leave unanswered questions behind, and you'll get to poke through the rubble of the evidence with a hardened skeptic and... Someone whose mind is more open to fun. Yeah, that's what I was going to (laughs) say. You can find Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie wherever you get your podcasts, and on social media at Ain't It Scary. Come play with us.